Hey everybody, I'm Dane Sanders. I want to welcome you to Fast Track Coaching. Uh, I'm not sure what number episode this is, but it's a special one for a lot of reasons, which I'll get to in just a second. But if you're new to the show, this is basically a, a 30 minute conversation where I get a chance to interview some pretty remarkable people, both inside and outside the photo industry. And the intent is to help you move your business or your creativity or both uh, forward just a little bit this week. Uh, the whole focus of Fast Track Coaching is implementation and for you to not just gobble up information. There's a lot of content on the internet. Uh, the point isn't content. The point is to take the content and do something with it. And I hope today's conversation will inspire and help in that regard. Uh, we're very privileged uh, to have Joel Grimes here with us. And Joel is someone who I have had esteem for for a long time from a distance. And recently I was uh, staring at your website forever and just like kind of wanting to vomit and throw my camera against the wall, that kind of thing. And, and through the process of doing that, I was like, this is ridiculous. He's a colleague, we're colleagues, this industry is awesome. I'm just gonna call him up, and I did, and you were very gracious, and um, I'd watched, recently I'd watched your whole Framed episode, and I know that a lot of folks had seen that, and you, were, you spoke at Photoshop World recently, and you're all over the place. Uh, but first off, welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, really, um, excited for, for you guys at home to engage in this dialogue, because Joel will also be in the chat room when this is playing live. So the hope is that uh, as we're dialoguing, you guys can engage us as well when we're going live. I guess, Joel, to start off with, can you share a little bit about your journey to, to get to where you are? Right now, we're sitting in his uh, pretty amazing studio up here in Pasadena, and but you weren't always in Pasadena. This is kind of a recent move. Yes. Um, talk a little bit about your journey to, to get here. Well, I started uh, actually in high school. Um, had a, uh, an intro to photography. So like eight years ago? Yeah, exactly. Give or take. Give or take. 35. <laughs> Got it. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't very good in, in the classroom, hmm. academically wise. It just wasn't fit my, there wasn't the right fit for me. And I was really good at, like, taking things apart and exploring. And, and, and I was in sports. And so I was always kind of out in the field or looking out the window, whatever, whatever it is. Uh -huh. not, not in a classroom. But photography was the first sort of opportunity for me to um, excel in a classroom. Hmm. And it was art related, which I had an interest in. But, you know, your parents don't really support that. I mean, they, what I'm struck by in that, though, is like even as you're saying that, you, you know, you look at your work, you're... You've been doing this for a while. Uh, you're you're very uh, you're 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 very competent technically, which requires some degree of you know some 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 work on the math side of things. Did you approach it when you were coming into it strictly around composition and kind of what you're drawn to, or was it that the subject matter became so interesting that that's what really drew you in to want to learn the technical aspects of, of light? I, I think that most people, like even like some of my boys, I got four boys, uh -huh. uh, two out of the four aren't very good at math, uh -huh. but we've learned and I've learned over over my lifetime uh -huh. that when you have an interest in something, mm -hmm. you can learn it. Mm -hmm. It may take me five times as, as long to learn something that someone else might learn you know, really quickly, right. uh, but on the flip side, I can learn something a lot quicker than someone else that may be really good at math. Mm. So our brains are that way. We're just designed that way. Right. Uh, good or bad. A willingness to persevere when it gets tough, see it all the way through. So it's not about necessarily like, a, are, you, are you perfect for math? It's like, well, if you're perfect for photography, you're going to figure out the math one way. Well, you have to. And I actually, when I work, um, I, tell, I tell people that photography is not a technical process. Mm. And they look at me kind of funny because... Um, we think it is. And, and there's a lot of technique and technical things we have to learn. Sure. However, um, I've come to understand that, that it, the, the photographic process, mm -hmm. right, as we start from, say, I have an idea in my head uh -huh. to, let's say, I want to execute that, and then to the final, it's through the Photoshop or whatever it is, to the wall. Right. It is a series of steps that um, uh, require a creative decisions mm. that only a creative mind can make mm. and there's a lot of them like a decision tree kind of thing like well it could be and uh -huh. so i mean even from the frame that you use or how much white you put around a, a, a print mm -hmm. is a creative decision mm -hmm. um and it, so we have a series of them and so uh and that's the beauty of what we do mm. is that um if 
given the same task, you and I are going to end up different places. Totally. And a lot of times what we want to do is I look at where you end up and I say, I wish I could end up where you're at. And so then I try to copy that. But the fact is, is that you have all these mm. desires and interests and likes and dislikes and we might call handicaps. Sure. That, that steer you down a certain path. Right. And so uh, it's impossible for me to be you and it's, it's impossible for you to be me. Mm. And once you kind of embrace that, mm. it's actually kind of fun because then what happens is the, the pressure is kind of off mm. in a way. Um, the problem is, is that when we go out and say, mm. look, I want to create what I love to create and work within or go down that path, it's kind of scary because it takes um, putting your head on a chopping block, so to speak, mm -hmm. because you put yourself out there mm -hmm. and people are going to take a swing at that. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is most of us get kind of derailed from what we really want, should be doing because we listen to others uh, who have sort of maybe made a comment or, um, you know, it, 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 it discourages us sometimes. Mm -hmm. and. So I always say, don't let one person steal your dream. Mm -hmm. Don't let one person derail you from what you should be doing, mm -hmm. and because they're going to be out there. They sure are. It could be your. It could, <laughs> it could even be your 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 parent. Your dad says the voice in your head. Yeah, some or, or your spouse, or you, you right. know your best friend, or right. someone that says, "What are you doing that for? You shouldn't be doing that." And and uh, so um, I, I always try to encourage people to to work within their uniqueness, uh, do what they love. Take the risk and put it out there. Mm. And in the end, uh, I think there's going to be big rewards. Mm. The stuff that you guys, most of you are seeing right now that I'm doing mm -hmm. is a result of me literally uh, about four or five years ago um, saying, I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to go for it. Mm. Okay. And I've been shooting commercially and doing ad campaigns and even on a national level right. prior to that. But it was a point where I said, look, I got to do something a little different. I got to mix it up. I'm kind of bored. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, um, I took a big risk and I said, okay, here's pretty much a complete new lighting, uh, technique, which was kind of a three edgy a light approach mm -hmm. and a Photoshop technique of mixing the, the color and the black and white and getting this really edgy look, mm -hmm. uh, and saying, I'm going to repeat this over and over and over again until I build a body of work. Mm. And in doing that, the world has really taken notice, which has really been a surprise to me mm. because I've always sort of been very comfortable at, uh, you know, being a photographer and had a passion for it and have done, I, say, I would say, I've made a good living at it. Right. Uh, to be able to sort of have that go onto a level where I'm looked at as, say someone who sets a trend mm -hmm. or in the teaching arena, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. someone has a voice. Yep. I'm totally stunned mm -hmm. by it. Um, it's a journey that, that I could not have necessarily said, um, this is what I want to do and, and get here mm -hmm. to where I'm at today. Yeah. It's just kind of fallen into place. That, that resonates. I mean, it, it's funny, you guys aren't, don't get this cause you're watching it through the video, but even the context that we're in and everything that you're saying resonates with kind of authentically with what everything I've experienced both on the phone with you prior to this call or this, this interview and meeting your wife, meeting your son, or one of your sons, uh, seeing your space, you seem like a, a um, committed photographer who's doing a ton of work and because it's getting noticed, now all of a sudden, I'm guessing it's like a new set of challenges to figure out, gosh, how do I, what am I attending to? How am I attending to those things and how do I stay focused when so many voices are saying like, yeah, Joel, come do a workshop. Yeah, Joel, go on Kelby, Kel you know, whatever the thing is. Uh, how, how do you find uh, that, that center in those moments too, where you are, because I know you have a heart to educate. You have a heart for people who want to learn this craft so that you can kind of, even even having kids, there's legacy there. Now you have legacy with photographers. How do you hold that, that tension between still pushing the threshold with your work and also having a chance to share it with other folks. Well, the, one of the things that I, I've always sort of, I know, I know this sounds weird, but and I, even when I did a book on the Navajo, I spent two years in the field mm -hmm. and I sat down with the publisher at the very beginning. He said, you know, what do you want to accomplish with this book? And I mm -hmm. said, uh, a body of work that I'm 
that it represents me as an artist. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, what about money? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't plan on making any money in this right. book? I said, no, that's not even an issue. And even with my photography, whether I'm making 10 grand a day or 1,000 a day, you know, it, I, I attack each day the same. Mm -hmm. And I'm an artist, mm -hmm. I have a passion to create, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, I wanna say, you know what? Today was a lot of fun. I actually created something. I problem solved something. I had an opportunity to do something and photograph a, uh, a person that, you know, uh, was a lot of fun. And, and so I don't really look at the money aspect of it so, so much. Now, we do need money to survive. Of course. But um, if money becomes your central focus, you will not achieve. I, don't, I think you have a hard time achieving it. It's a weird thing because um, now what happens is, is people see... Um, the the passion that I have for the craft and for the final product and they say we want to hire this guy because he's an artist and money yeah you have to negotiate that you have to make sure you you know you get paid for your time mm -hmm. but in the end it's not about money in fact even when I do these big ad campaigns and there's a lot of money involved um, a lot of times what I do is I know that the industry supports big budgets on occasion mm -hmm. and then there's times where you don't have big budgets and you have to squeeze things I just sort of say okay let's make sure we can get it and make it happen and do it right mm -hmm. and in the end if I have to lose a little bit out of my fee I don't mind mm -hmm. and, and our directors know that mm -hmm. it's an interesting thing in the end they know that if you fight for every little dime they're gonna, come, yeah, right. they're gonna come back to you right and so, so it's still a rapport issue. It's still like you have to, people still want to work with people they like. That's right. And uh, establishing that relationship matters. Well, it's funny, this conversation around money and creativity has come up a lot with some of my guests in the past. And I'm, I'd love to pursue that a little with you because it seems like when you get to the nitty gritty, especially for folks who are at home, they really, they may have gotten in because of an artistic interest or because their their passion for photography or, or a whole host of reasons of why they get into photography. And then in the middle of it, uh, maybe their husband lost their job, or maybe uh, you know the pressures show up, and it it goes from this more idealistic approach to what I want to do in the craft uh, to a very kind of opportunistic survival mentality, scarcity mindset, uh, which again I, I appreciate. Like I don't I don't want to be judgmental or just kind of swiftly go over that. How do you deal with those those seasons where it's just lean? And you still have to, you, you, you want to keep the, the integrity of the work you're doing, uh, even though you might be tempted. And because I know there's folks that are going to be home watching this saying like, well, that's fine for Joel Grimes. I mean, have you seen his body of work? Have you seen where he's at? Like, of course he can tell the publisher. But if these folks are at home and they're really, they're just trying to make a go at it. And they're really tempted to, to cut corners creatively. What, what would you say to them? Well, okay, you kind of have two, two, two options to approach your craft. One is, is you can um, bill yourself out as a sort of a, a technician, mm -hmm. meaning that I can accomplish, you, you want a, a wedding, I can take pictures, you yep. get clean images, in the end, uh, you're going to get, you know, uh, what it is, a documentation, so to speak, of maybe a wedding. Yeah. Okay? And, and nothing's wrong with that. Right. Okay? We need people like that. Um, and so, uh, the problem is, is that if you, if you look, if you bill yourself out as a technician, yep. you can only get a technician's wage. That's your ceiling. Okay. What are the market bears? That's right. Okay. So like in the, um, I had a friend who's a product shooter mm -hmm. and he came to me and he said, I got an opportunity to buy this digital bag. Um, and I can put it on. This is before digital is what we have today. Right. But it was on a it was on a four by five, and it was a uh, I don't even know what megapixels, but it was probably like five or six megapixels. Right. This is a long time ago. Right. And the back was just by itself was uh, fifty grand. Five zero. Yeah. Got it. And I, so I asked him. I said, "Well, um, number one, how are you going to pay for it?" And he said, "I'm going to take a second on my home." I said, "Not a good idea." Mm. And I said, but what advantage is that back going to give you over your competition? Mm. He says, well, now I can say to my clients, I'm shooting digital. Mm. Okay. And I said, well, what, what advantage does that give your clients? And he's like, well, I can get the files to them faster, don't have to shoot film, obviously, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, and, and it saves the client money. That's what he said. Mm. And I said, well, then who's going to pay for the back? Mm. So if you don't charge the client for film and processing, 
Right. You know, how do you get it, how do you make your money back? That's right. And so with this whole conversation, well, I walked away from that and I got to thinking about that and I thought, is it interesting that we as photographers, a lot of times what we do, and I've been guilty of this, mm -hmm. is we think if I have, uh, you know, this piece of equipment. That's right. I'm going to be able to, my clients are going to think I'm really professional or think, hey, Joel's got this. You or know, some justification. Whatever. Yeah, totally. And, and so I'm trying to sell my services by a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the end, though, you're falling into a trap, which means you're not selling your client on your creativity or the fact that you're an artist. Yeah. Okay. So, which is the opposite of the technician. Exactly. So here's the funny thing is. Is if you're if you sell yourself on on the, say the technical process, mm -hmm. so you're really good technically, mm -hmm. you're limited to a technician's wage. But if you sell yourself as an artist, there's no ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so would you say that? It's, but as an artist, it's tougher to get the work. No, mm -hmm. in the end, it's not, because we want the most of us uh, as buyers mm -hmm. we buy our car because it looks really good mm -hmm. yes it's got a v8 or a four cylinder whatever right. it is that you have but you it's, want it. it's not about the v8 no you're right it's about the look of it and um we buy shoes because they look good yes we want a pair of shoes that last but ultimately it's because of what it looks like and so when uh an art buyer or an art director or a mom and a and a, and a bride come in mm -hmm. to look at your work right they're wanting something that's going to rock their little, they're going to go, wow, this, is, this guy is an artist. Yeah. He can give me something that someone else can't. Yes, there's a budget. So it's true that there's a lot of people that can't afford an artist. That's right. Okay, so they get a technician that can do a real good job and, it out. and cover the event. Um, but if you want something that's creative, you have to pay for an artist. Mm -hmm. And so here's, here's the fun part about it, okay? Here's how you go and, and, and take over your town. Okay, so, get your paper in. Yeah. Go okay. Go okay, good. Good. If you want to be the number one shooter in town, okay. Okay. You have to create a persona that you're the best in the business. Right. So it's like a in terms yeah. of a brand. Got it. Okay. And you can do you can play the game and say I'm the most expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And some people get away with that. Right. But in the end, it comes back. Yeah, it doesn't really. Right. But if you say um, you know, uh, I'm creating a one-of-a-kind experience for this bride and groom mm -hmm. and the family. And here's what I can do for you. And you go and you, you attack it like, you know, it's a the whole shebang. coffee table book That's or right. whatever. Right. They're gonna, they're gonna, that's what they're going to say, I, I, we want that. And mm -hmm. what does it cost? And it may be out of their range. But, but at least they go, that's what we want for my... Even if they can't afford it, that's what we're going to talk about with yes. other people. That's going to yes. be perception yes. and the rub. Yeah. So how do you build that? Okay. Here's, here's, here's what I would tell people. And in fact, I said if I... And I, I shot weddings in college, and it was very tough. <laughs> shooting a wedding is actually harder than shooting an ad campaign. That's what I tell people. But um, it's not people, easy. Well, it's funny. People, people actually need to hear that because I think there's folks at home... There's so much of photography that I've discovered, I've only been at this for a decade, but my, my impression is that a lot of it is exposure and reps uh, on the technical side. And the creativity side, that's, that's more like a life work, like you're just constantly leaning into the craft. Is that a fair statement, do you think? Yeah. I mean, okay, you can learn techniques, for the most part, pretty quick. Right. Okay? So, um, you know, if you say, hey, look, back in the days when... I was a landscape photographer, and I had a big view camera, uh -huh. and you know, I said, I want to learn the zone system, or right. whatever it was at the time. Right. I can sit down and learn that. Right. And now, faster than ever, because there's so many resources. Absolutely. Got it. What I can learn, I tell people, you can learn today, in about two years, what took me 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we were accelerated that. Right. But here's how, you, here's how you take the town by storm. Okay? If you think about it, and, I, and this is kind of a little bit rough, but I say this, that if you're a wedding photographer, what are the odds that you're going to get a bride and groom that look like models? Pretty rare. Pretty rare. Okay. I mean, I, on average, really rare. Very rare. Yeah. Okay. Now, when a bride and groom come in the door, or the, the, the bride and the mom mm -hmm. uh, come in the door to look at your work, okay, what have they been, what has the bride been looking at for models. three months? All, nothing but models. Models, right? Magazines, right? Okay, so if you show, uh, say, here's a, the, my latest wedding, uh -huh. and say it was done very well, but the bride's a little heavy, uh -huh. 
maybe the groom looks like he just woke up. Right. It, it's just not going to impress them. Right. So, since you can't really get, on average, a bride and groom that looks like a model, uh-huh. what do you have to do? Mock it up. See, this is very controversial, especially in the, and, and I'm with you. Like, here's where I'm with you. I, one, one benefit that, depending on where you live, at least, and I, I don't shoot as many weddings as I used to shoot, but I'm struck by, um, there are some opportunities, like, in, in certain regions of the country where the style is a certain kind of way, where you, know, you might have more chance than other places. But again, if you're shooting 50 weddings a year, on average, I'm guessing, um, I've never had a year where I shot 50 weddings a year. It's not been my game. But the ones who have tell me, like, it's, there's sometimes when it's, they get the gorgeous couple, and there's other times you don't. Um, but the idea of a mock up, that can be so, um, there's this whole movement in our industry, in this genre, that say, well, it's inauthentic, it's not real, you're, you're not really setting it up the way that you would have to pull off on a day. And oftentimes, I think a lot of those folks who have that perspective, Probably come from a more of a journalistic background. They, they, sure. you know that kind of vibe. And you've seen, you've heard exactly. all these things oh, before. I've heard every argument under the book. So what do you say to that? Well, here's the thing. Um, you, you look at my work, okay? That, which, which, by the way, this is awesome. I, I love your work, and and, right. and I know a little bit of what you do. But go ahead. So, I set up about fifty self assignments a year, no paid. On you. On me. Okay? 50, I, 5, 50, 0. 50, I, I'm averaging about 50 to 60 a year that I am creating, that I'm mocking up. How do you think I end up now shooting Blake, uh, you know, Griffin, uh, right. superstar? Right. How did I get there? I had to go and mock up a lot of athletes on my own. Right. To get there. Right. So put yourself in that position. I shoot those athletes over and over. I grab anyone I can off the streets, whatever. Right. And then I start building this body of work. Then eventually someone calls. And then... See, I wonder... That resonates with, with so many of our guests we talk to, do, do these personal projects. They talk about this all the time. But, and again, I, this comes back to what you said at the beginning of listening to different voices and what are you willing to do to put yourself in a position, the best possible position. And I'm with you with what you're saying. And I'm wondering, is there a distinction, though, between... Um, say, going to uh, a workshop where you're kind of over someone's shoulder while they're creating something, and, and that's part of your body of work, versus like what you're describing, which seems totally different, where you're, um, and in, you're enthusiastically, 50 assignments a year that you're self-giving yourself to, to it's not just to, to get a body of work, but even probably to define your style. And well, you grow. You really extend your capacity. As oh, a photographer. it's amazing. Tomorrow I'm shooting a, a swimmer. She's a competitive swimmer. Uh-huh. I'm setting the whole thing up. Now, why I, can I really afford that? Not really. Uh-huh. My time is so valuable right now. Right. But the fact is, is I know that I have to stay current. That's right. And I know that if I get the right model in here and I go and I do some exploring with that, that with lighting, whatever it is, that I'm going to end up with a good portfolio piece. That's right. I know it's just that's the, the, the way it is. The reality. And I've got some ideas for backgrounds I'm going to put her in. Um, and so I'll be shooting those this weekend. I'm going all the way up to San Francisco to shoot some, some really cool stuff. Right. So um, I take the risk and, you know, the, the, uh, um, the cost mm-hmm. of doing that because I know that's what's going to put me on the map. Mm-hmm. So, okay, I ask people, can you learn how to ride a bike? And they say, well, yeah, I, I learned it. How long did it take you? Mm, I was 12 years old or 8 years old, whatever. It took me a couple days, three yes. days, with my dad teaching me. Okay. Well, I got a couple sons that learned how to ride a unicycle. Hmm. Okay. Well, how long does it take you to ride a unicycle? If you are dedicated, you can do it in about three days, maybe a week. It takes about a week, and then you just get you get to where you can go, like from right. point A to point B. And right. then it takes you about a month where you can move around. Right. To go backwards, it takes you another, you know. But um, now you met Aaron. Yes. And. There was, uh, uh, these kids, my sons were into this, all these videos of, of this guy, Chris Holmes, was the, like Tony Hawk of, you know, skateboarding. Uh-huh. He was the, the guy that was the, the greatest unicycler on the planet, right? Uh-huh. And they'd watch all these videos, and they were little guys. They were 12, 13, you know, 14 years old around then. Uh-huh. And um, they, came, they came running to me, and they said, Dad, and I used to ride a unicycle when I was a kid. And they said, Dad, uh, Chris Holmes is coasting down a, a mountain uh, road. Uh, going like 40 miles an hour and the pedals are just spinning. He's just coasting on the unicycle. 
And I said, no, 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 that's impossible. You can't do that. Uh, I mean, this must be trick photography, right? right? right. Well, we got into it where I watched the video and I'm looking and I'm thinking, this is really happening, right? Uh -huh. Well, a couple months later, he was going to be at this big event. It was in Moab, about 300 unicycles were gathering. Uh -huh. And my son, Aaron, who you met, he beelined it to Chris Holmes. Uh -huh. And he went up and said, I want to learn how you coast on a unicycle. Uh -huh. And I was standing right there, and, and, and Chris says, well, there's only five people in the world that know how to do this now. And he says, are, are, you, are you serious about learning? He said, uh -huh. He had the braces, and, uh -huh. just, and 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 uh, he said, "Well, it'll take you it'll take you a year if you do it uh, at least minimum of an hour every night." So 365 days or hours. hours, right? And you can get it. And he said, "This is how you do it." And he taught him taught him how. And it, it, you you start very slowly, but it's basically dragging your foot on that tire. So both feet are up, oh, but you're dragging, you're else. creating right. friction. Right. But it's so difficult to learn this, right? Well. Aaron every day out there practicing. The next year we went to the event and there was Chris Holmes and my son Aaron coasting down the mountain pass. No yeah. kidding. Yep, he learned it. No kidding. So I tell people. And, then, you, well, and let me ask you this. If he had not talked to Chris Brown, is that his name? Chris Holmes. Holmes, yeah. sorry. Um, how many hours do you think it would have taken him? Well, he didn't, he, first of all, you don't even know that's possible. That's right. Someone came up with that. Okay, then you go, I want, I want that. That's my goal. That's right. And then, yes, he showed him the shortcut, so to mm -hmm, speak, mm -hmm. um, you know, to get there. Right. But it still took every day for an hour for a year. Wow. And even after that, he had to learn more. You know, he got better at it from there. But here's my point is that um, if you have a goal, you say, where do I want to end up? Mm -hmm. That's my point. Do you want to be a commercial advertising photographer? Get clear in your vision of yeah. where you want to go. Do you want to shoot ad campaigns on a national level? Yep. Well, you can get there. If I can get there, so can the next person. Mm -hmm. But see, I had to set the goal to do that. So even if folks are at home going like, okay, you said that, but in their mind they're saying to themselves, yeah, but I really can't. You're exactly. re you really mean people actually, human beings, I believe it. can actually do this. I believe it. Okay, great. I'm with you 100%. And unless people tell themselves they can't, in which case they won't. Well, we do that all the time. We, yeah. we, we, we are, uh, um, I, have, I have a saying, okay, that every person on the planet is truly, to some degree, weak, fragile, and no insecure. Doubt. No doubt. Okay? First in line. And so some of us have a, a tougher facade than others, mm -hmm. but ultimately there's a breaking point in which we can crumble. No doubt. Okay? And so if you are out peddling your craft mm -hmm. and going door to door, mm -hmm. and you get rejection after rejection after rejection, you're going to crumble at some point. Right. Okay? And, but if you know this, okay, if you know that, how the market works, and that is, if I, I tell people, if I am, if I let's say I'm a country western uh, musician, okay, okay, and I want to get a producer or you know an album, you know, I want to get I want to get uh, uh, my work out there, mm -hmm. and I started to pedal that, and let's say I pedaled and I went to the row of all the uh, the music producers, uh, music labels, and I started hitting the rap artists, mm -hmm. the rap you know labels. What are the odds that I'm going to get a contract? Probably not, really. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to me out the door. Right. Okay? And so the problem is, is that often we are presenting what we do to someone, hmm. but we don't know what they're really looking for. Hmm. We don't know if they're a country western hmm. uh, lover or they're a rap lover. That's powerful. Okay. Now, so well, here's what happens. I present my work to a rap artist, mm -hmm. lover, mm -hmm. and they go, well, thank you for coming. And they throw me out the back door. Right. And that happens to me all the time. Mm -hmm. But what I do is I, I, I say to myself, guess what? I just happened to pedal on the wrong thing to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. And so I don't internalize it. Now, they could even be kind of rude to me. Mm -hmm. It has happened. Mm -hmm. And you just go, mm, okay, you know what? Uh, let it roll off your back because I know that it's, at some point right. I'm going to walk in the door and I'm going I'm to present my work, and they're going to go, oh, my goodness. And they start bowing down to you. They roll right. out the red carpet. Right. And you're like, wait, is this, am I on can candid camera here? Right. Is this like they a joke? They me, right, yeah. right, right. But really, that's truly what happened. I happened mm. to sell something they were looking for. Mm. And so that's the real world. So I have a saying that rejection is a 100% guarantee. Mm. It's going to happen. Yep. Over and over. In fact, probably on a daily basis. Right. So, but we internalize it. We crumble, 
we fall and get discouraged and then we crawl in a hole somewhere and then people say, well, uh, what do you do? And you say, well, I really want to be a photographer, but you know, I, I just couldn't make it. Right. Well, what they couldn't do is they couldn't overcome the fear of rejection. Yeah. It wasn't that, nothing to do with their skill levels. Sometimes, yeah, their skill level needs to be increased. No doubt. But um, there are some amazing photographers that literally aren't making any living at this because they can't get past that rejection mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. and they don't understand how the industry works. Mm -hmm. And so when I go pick up a phone to make a cold call, it's not easy, mm -hmm. but yet I know that the, on the end of that other line, that person could either be looking for what I want or That's not. Right. Right. And I'm not going to internalize it if they say I'm not interested. And here's an interesting thing, that studies have been proven, this is, this is how the world works, uh -huh. that creatives don't market effectively, uh -huh. okay? And so they say only about 5% of creatives do. Mm -hmm. And um, that most of us will never get past two attempts to market somebody. Mm -hmm. And the odds of having someone buy into what you want, whatever it is, the service you are, mm -hmm. is less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So if you say, hey, you know, make a phone call, send a packet out to someone, and they don't really respond to you, right. chances are you're not gonna get any work. If you do it eight times, your odds go up to 80% that that person will respond to you. Even if you get no, 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 no really no, no, no. Eventually, and go, they go, hey, you know what? I'll give it a try. Yeah, let's give this guy a try. He's persistent, right. and all of a sudden, they have a job with an edgy look that happens to be a and sports it, figure, and, right. and boom, you're in the door. Right. Okay, so let's, let's I, I want to be sensitive to our time, and, uh, and for you guys too at home, because I, I, this is so, this is gold right now. By the way, thank you for sharing and for being here. Um, what would you? And I ask this of a lot of my guests, but this it feels especially poignant. If you were starting out again, and you, and I know you have a great history of reinvention, where you, you go, you decide you want to be a, a startup again. You go, you start, you want to do it again, and that extends your reach and your capacity as a as a creative person. It, given our era that we're in right now, given uh, where our the photography industry is right now. Given that you know what you know, but let's say you're starting out from scratch. You just happen to have the years under your belt, but you don't have the benefit from it. You don't, get the, you don't have the gear, you don't, but you, you're committed. How do you spend your first year? Well, you would have to build a body of work. Okay, so, so that's great. So let's, so let's say you're an enthusiast. You've been building. You have, you have a, a camera, a basic lens, a little bit of light, uh, reflectors, diffusers, whatever you got. And... You have a little bit, a growing body of work, then what? You want to put a shingle out now, what do you do? Well, think about this, okay? It goes back kind of what we've been talking about, but let's say I want to, I want to shoot uh, skateboarders. Okay. I have an interest in skateboarders. Okay, perfect. And I know that Red Bull hires photographers that shoot skateboarder events. Right. Okay. And I go, I would love to do that. So how do I go about doing that? Well, number one is, Every single evening, I would be out where the skateboarders are, and I'd be shooting, 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 develop my, my techniques. And then, once I built enough images to where I could walk in the door or at least present it to someone, yep. I would be hounding that person. So Red Bull has people yep. that look at photographers. Right. And so I would be putting work in front of them. Always and good. they may say, you know what, your work is getting, is good, but not good enough. And you say, no worries. Boom, two months later. They go, you know what, it's getting there, it's getting there, and boom, boom. Uh, in one year, I'd be working for Red Bull. Hmm. It's just a matter of time. See, it's, what, it's what, just... what you're saying, Joel, is so resourceful for people to hear because it, it, um, it's resourceful for me to hear. I, I just, I, what, there's, there's a concreteness and a specificity and an enthusiasm to actually do the work. Because I think sometimes when people are, one of the reasons why we make the show so short is because I don't want people to watch it for very long. I want people to like, turn it off and go get to work. And, and I think that sometimes it's tempting to feel like, gosh, I learned something, I had an aha moment, and it scratched the itch like I did something when they didn't actually do anything yet. And what you're saying is a very, it's a very basic, like, no, no, you say you want to go shoot skateboarders. Well, first off, go shoot some skateboarders. That's right. <laughs> and then be persistently putting it in front of people and learning from the rejection. It's just feedback. Like, oh, that doesn't unlock the door. I got to kind of refine the key and come back at it again and come back at it again. And I, I, I wish for that for our industry, because I think it, for, the stuff, for all the laments I'm hearing around how bad the industry is, I mean, my goodness, there are people who are thriving. That's right. And the ones that are tend to be doing exactly what you're describing over and over and over again. 
What's really interesting is styles change so quick mm. that if you're a car shooter, let's say you're a car shooter in LA and you yep. shoot and you like the big ads, right? Right. And you go and show your portfolio to a big agency. Yep. You don't show cars that were shot two, three years ago. We can't. You can't. But you guess what? Wedding photographers do. They'll show work that shot 10, 15, 20 years ago. People are at home scratching right now. And they wonder why. <laughs> so let's say you could find the number one skateboarder photographer in the country. Mm -hmm. And you said, I want to tag along with you for a year. And you, or uh, for a day. Yes. And you watched him work. And at the end, you'd probably say, hmm, that's not that hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not doing anything all that special. But what's happened is he's learned how to photograph these skateboarders, right. uh, the, the moves that they do, the timing, everything, and the industry, the, the, the terminology mm -hmm. that the kids use, you know, so he fits in, whatever right. it is. And, and so he's, he understands the whole, the whole industry. Mm. And the photography part, the actual technical part of it, right. is not that difficult. Right. Yeah, maybe he's using some strobe and he's throwing light in there. How hard is it to learn how to strobe uh, someone doing a flip in the air. Right. Not that hard. Right. Once you figure it out, yeah. you figure it out. You know, that. well, okay, I'm going to shoot an uh, edge light here. Maybe, maybe I'll do, you know. But right. It's not that hard. Right. But um, it's building the body of work that represents the fact that you're an expert in the industry. Mm -hmm. So how long does it take? Not that long. You want to pick surfers? You want to pick um, NASCAR? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, you go, I love this industry. Mm -hmm. Go after it and you can get there really mm -hmm. quick. And, and would you recommend picking the one? Because there's a lot of folks who are like, weddings, parties, anything, they'll shoot. If it... Well, okay, think about this. Um, you have to brand yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay? So um, if, if, you, if you go to a gallery and you say, I'd love to have a show. I'm a photographer. I'm right. an artist. I'm going to have a show here. Right. And the, the, the curator is going to ask you, what body of work are you, are you currently working on? Mm -hmm. You say, well, I got a picture of a sunset. Right. Picture of my cat. <laughs> you know, I went on vacation to Hawaii. You know, right. and they're going to go, well, where's the body of work? Where's the story? Right. Yeah, they want a, a, a theme. Okay, it's no different that when you're pitching an art director or an art uh, buyer, creative director, or whatever it is, they want to see w a, a body of work that represents you. Mm. Okay, so then it sticks in their head. Mm. If you get too confusing, they're not going to know. They're not going to know who you are. Well, there's a great practical outplay out of this. Is like anyone watching this, you can go right now to your website, look at your body, or better yet, bring someone else who doesn't know what you do and say, what do you think I do? Exactly. And get the feedback and then make an adjustment. Another mistake that we, I made, and, and I think we all make, uh -huh. is we want to be, uh, what is it, the master, the master of none, jack of all trades. Right, right, right. You know, the generalist. Yes. Right. right. And... Um, you know, you shoot product, you shoot weddings, you shoot, you know, architecture, you shoot all this stuff. And and I get the intention. It's like, gosh, I want to have a broad swath of clients that, that with a diversified revenue stream. But go ahead. you got to be specialized. Yeah. And, uh, and do really good at it. Right. And so if you want to be an architectural photographer, study the, the good architectural photographers. Mm -hmm. uh, go to uh, buildings that are current right you know that are the the cutting edge of the architectural realm right um in fact i had a friend who wants to do architecture and i said get a plane ticket and go to dubai mm. no dubai kidding. is where it's happening or malaysia no kidding go what, where what it, great input yeah yes. we're, what's that ticket gonna cost you 1500 bucks right and you know five days of hotels and food right and, and in five days you could create a body of work that would rock anyone in town right. that's trying to do architecture right and you got it. a couple grand, you got your, you know, a body of work. But people don't think of that, you know. Um, it's and, and then look at what's current, you know, in terms of the architectural, you know, right, books, you right, know, the right. magazines and stuff, and say, hey, what's what's really looking, you know, uh, what's current? And um, and then I develop a style, you know, that's that's branding Joel Grimes. Mm -hmm. The greatest single, um, probably compliment you could give me, mm -hmm. is um, I saw a picture. And I knew it was you before I looked at the credit. No doubt. That branded Joel Grimes. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, good or bad. Right. Some people say, oh, it's the same old Joel, Joel Grimes picture. <laughs> I don't care. It still is. Because so long as I'm having fun doing it. Right. And I feel like it's it's a part of uh, my vision as an artist. I'm going to do it. Right. And people say, how long are you going to do the three light look? I go, as long as I want to do it. I find it interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, Joel, thank you so much for being on the show. Excellent. I really appreciate Excellent. it. And uh, I know, folks, if you're at home and you want to find out more, I know uh, Joel has some great DVDs, great intensives, 
Uh, he's, if you're from Southern California, he's local now. Uh, don't don't bum rush his door, but uh, at least uh, check his website out at JoelGrimes.com. And on Twitter, are you on the Twitter? Uh, yeah. I think it's Joel Ren's photo. <laughs> <laughs> you can find him on the Twitter. But uh, thanks to that, uh, to Joel and also to Adorama for, for supporting this, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Thanks. Good job.